Welcome back to our Bible study in the Gospel of Matthew. We are now entering that portion that tells about those final days of Jesus' life, of the leading into the betrayal, the crucifixion, and the resurrection. And so we pick up today with uh, chapter 26, and we will be uh, breaking these apart not just by chapter, going in a little more in depth. There's a lot in these final chapters of Matthew, so we want to uh, give them the appropriate time. Let's, uh, let us pray together. Gracious Lord, we thank you for watching over us each and every day throughout this past week, and we also pray that you will continue to strengthen and guide those who are on the forefront of helping others with the virus and also especially those who are helping those who are, have been put out of work, those who are offering food, resources, especially we pray for those who are seeking their unemployment, that they may be able to get through and get access to the help that they need. Give us strength to be there for others and help us to give a call, give a text, and look out for one another. Be with us as we enter into these words, especially to hear what you have to say to us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So this portion is, again, a pivotal change. It is the culmination of everything that has been going on about Jesus' life and his ministry. It's a turning point for sure, but we're not at all meant to forget what has come leading up to this. We pick up in chapter 26 of Matthew, reading verse 1 and 2. When Jesus had finished saying all these things, he said to his disciples, You know that after two days the Passover is coming, and the Son of Man will be handed over to be crucified. So here, Jesus had just finished a significant portion of teaching. Throughout the Gospel of Matthew, we are given a great deal of Jesus teaching and he just had shared some very important things just before this he had spoken of that judging that son of man sitting as a king judging the nation separating the sheep from the goats and who was it that had served this king it was those who had fed those who were hungry give drink to the thirsty visited those who were in prison sick and take care of them. And Jesus said, when you did this, you did this to the least of these, my brothers and sisters. Jesus, he is the one who is that king who would sit in judgment. And yet at this moment, now he says, he is like those little ones. He is the one who will be betrayed, imprisoned, he will be the one who would be forgotten and left behind. So now he enters closely to the very ones that he was so very, very concerned about. That phrase, when Jesus had finished saying all these things, that's a tip-off. That's helping us understand that even though this is the pinnacle of all of what Jesus came to accomplish, his fullest purpose in his ministry on earth. Everything that went before, though, matters. Everything that he taught, the Beatitudes, the parables, but also his actions, the healing, and the many ways, the miracle of the loaves. These are all important. We need to remember that this Jesus who has taught us all these ways, both in word and deed, who is now going to go to face the cross. We are also 
meant to know that this is all taken place, taking place around the time of the Passover. Picking up again, verse 3 through 5. Then the chief priests and the elders of the people gathered in the palace of the high priest, who was called Caiaphas, and they conspired to arrest Jesus by stealth and kill him. But they said, not during the festival, or there may be a riot among the people. The Passover was the most important time of the Jewish year. It was the remembering of the time when they had been slaves in Egypt, centuries and centuries before, but how God had rescued them, had sent the plagues, and then the final plague, the angel of death, which passed over the houses of the Jewish people who had put the blood of the spotless lamb above the door. And so the angel of death would pass over that household and not kill the eldest child of that household. And this was a remembrance of that freedom, that gift of freedom that God gave to the Jewish people. And so they are gathered to do their gathering to celebrate. It's uh, almost there, just a couple days away. Now, Caiaphas was the high priest, the great, greatest leader at the moment for those Jews. He was the high priest, and he was there from the year 18 to the year 37. So that gives us uh, the appropriate window uh, from when we know that Jesus also was arrested and then crucified. Now, they did not want anything to happen during Passover. There would be so many people gathered in Jerusalem. Again, if you were going to make it to Jerusalem, this was the time. Kind of like Times Square on New Year's Eve. I'm not sure why people like to do that, but it's a thing. Well, at any rate, they are afraid of the crowds, that Jesus was popular, and that if they were to do anything at this time, the crowds would turn against them and maybe come to Jesus' defense, try to fight for Jesus. So they're trying to avoid anything. So they're trying to be uh, stealthy, sneaky, uh, try to figure a way to get at Jesus without alerting the crowds to what they're doing. I think their preference would have been to actually wait till it all was done before they would have carried out any action. Whenever I get to this part of the story, and I'm reminded again of what the meaning of Passover is, there are two parts to this. There is the Passover, which was the event of the meal, the special meal called the Seder meal. But there is also the festival of the unleavened bread. That festival lasted for days, multiple days. But the Passover itself was toward at the beginning. And that was the special meal that Jesus was getting ready to share with his disciples. And so we hear again, from the beginning in, um, in verse 6 of chapter 26. Now, while Jesus was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, a woman came to him with an alabaster jar of very costly ointment, and she poured it on his head as he sat at the table. But when the disciples saw it, they were angry and said, Why this waste? For this ointment could have been sold for a large sum and the money given to the poor. I notice that the high priest and the elders are gathered in the palace. Jesus is gathering with his disciples at the house of Simon the leper in the smaller town outside of Jerusalem. It's a big contrast, isn't it? And Jesus, again, he is associating with those little ones, one of those sick 
who would have been avoided. And yet he goes to Simon's house to share a meal with him. And that shows acceptance and commitment to be together. Well, then this unusual surprising thing happens. A woman comes in and she has this very expensive ointment and oil and she takes the flask and she opens it and she pours it over Jesus' head and the oil, the fragrant oil is just dripping down and the disciples are upset. They're angry and they say, but, 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 but we could have sold this to, to help the poor. Well, I can't fully blame them. On the one hand, they have heard what Jesus has been teaching of God's great care for those who are poor and that God is on the side of the poor. And so their reaction is in a way seemingly appropriate. But is it also a bit of self-righteousness on their part to this woman, this strange woman showing this great devotion and piety and care for Jesus. Maybe they were thinking, oh, why didn't I think of that first? Maybe they were a little jealous. The thing is, they weren't exactly wrong, but she wasn't wrong either. It had to do with a matter of timing. This was a pivotal moment. There was something that Jesus was about to do that was going to change the world forever. And God gave her the insight and the desire to honor Jesus in a special way at this time. Picking up in verse 10 through 13. But Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why do you trouble the woman? She has performed a good service for me. For you always have the poor with you, but you will not always have me. By pouring this ointment on my body, she has prepared me for burial. Truly I tell you, wherever this good news is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in remembrance of her. And that's true. That story has been told again and again and again. Well, again, the disciples were upset and not, not completely wrong, but what they were missing was, again, the timing. This was a unique time. This was Jesus' hour. This was the final moments approaching. And she was given the insight the understanding, the revelation of what was to come. And so she goes to Jesus and she anoints him and Jesus identifies that as relating to like the anointing of a body that has, is being readied for burial. The body that is dead, he's not dead, but still that kind of anointing is what would be done to prepare the body to be for its final burial and that her action is like a foreshadowing of Jesus' death, which is to come. You will have the poor with you always. Yes, God, Jesus, cares deeply for the poor, for the downtrodden, for the outcast. And we do always have opportunity to show God's love, to care for others. And especially at this time, there is so much need and in any way, if at all possible, to give food, to give donation to Lutheran Social Service, just to be a good neighbor, to listen, run an errand, be there to help, pray, 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 pray. These are ways that we continue to live in that care for those who are poor, or at least poor at the moment. Now, the disciples, again, they may be just as much upset, not, not that about the poor, 
but in their own kind of self-righteousness. But we know better, Lord. You taught us. We know better. We need to be careful about judging the sincerity of another's faith. Only God knows, and we're not to be the judge of that. We pick up in verse 14 through 16. Then one of the twelve, who was called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and said, What will you give me if I betray him to you? They paid him 30 pieces of silver. And from that moment, he began to look for an opportunity to betray him. Again, there's always these contrasts. This woman comes and gives abundantly, so generously. Now, somehow, perhaps, Judas was even more offended than the others. All, it said all the disciples were offended at this moment. But something got triggered, perhaps, even more so for Judas. And so it's the moment, at least, where he takes it into his head, into his hands, to go aside to leave and find those other leaders and to make part of the plan to betray Jesus. Now, Jesus is there always, again, giving. Judas comes along and says, what will I get? If I give him up to you, what will I get? We'll never quite know what fully motivated Judas. In the Gospel of John, there is an implication that he was the one who oversaw the money and that he was maybe skimming some and that that's why he was upset that the ointment wasn't sold and then the money put into their treasury because then he could have got his hands on it. There's another perspective, though, is that perhaps Jesus was part of the zealots. And the zealots were those who were a bit more militant. They, they really wanted there to be an uprisal. And that he may have felt that Jesus should have been more bold and that he was trying to trigger something to happen, that maybe if he stirred the pot enough, Jesus would finally step up and show that he would be the kind of military, political, kingly messiah leader that the people often had hoped for but that wasn't going to be the way of jesus and for whatever reason judas goes to make part of this plan he's offered 30 silver pieces of silver which would have been probably uh, shekels now i have to admit uh, when i hear 30 pieces of silver I don't know why, because I know it's wrong, but my, my head goes, hmm, 30 dimes. It doesn't sound like much, does it? Well, again, this piece of silver was most likely a silver shekel uh, equal to the four denarii. And if you remember our denarii, uh, denarii meaning the earnings of a day laborer, what one day's work for a day laborer would be. So 30 silver shekels would be equivalent of 120 denarii. That's day labor, 120 days worth of labor. Four months. Now again, that's, that's you know, a common hourly basic, most basic wage, but still, four months. That was a pretty big sum that Judas was being offered to give up Jesus. Turn to um, in verse 17 through 19. On the first day of the unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus saying, Where do you want us to make the preparations for you to eat the Passover? He said, Go into the city to a certain man and say to him, Teacher, my time is near. I will keep the Passover the teacher says, my time is near. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. So the disciples did as Jesus directed them, and they prepared the Passover meal. 
this is the, it says the first day of the unleavened bread. Again, I'm being reminded of these. The first day of the unleavened bread, that was the, the whole festival was for like seven days. But the day before was a day of preparing the house and you had to clear the house of the unleavened bread. This was the day of preparing for the Passover meal. And so this is what they're going to be doing. So Jesus gives them this instruction to tell them to go into the city. Now, I can't tell the exact, exact thing, but I do know that the Passover was meant to be on the certain day of the Jewish month of Nisan, N-I-S-A-N, -N, and it had to come after the first, at the first full moon, after the spring equinox. So the spring equinox in our calendar is around March 21st, and then it has to come after that first full moon after that. Well, Easter is associated to Passover because this is all connected. So our, whenever the first full moon comes after the spring equinox, that's why Passover and Easter moves around because each year when the full moon shows up can be a little different. So that's why we get this moving around of our holiday. So Jesus now says, he says, go tell them to help. This is, I'm coming. Let's get ready. He says, my time is near. And that word for time there is the word chronos. Throughout the uh, the New Testament especially, there's two words that are used for time from the Greek. And the one word is the word kairos, and the other word is the word chronos. And chronos, like chronology, um, like a calendar, like a clock, kind of just tracking time, that's chronos. But kairos is the right time. This is God's time. This is when God ordains something to be. And so Jesus says, my time is near. This is approaching of his death and his resurrection. This is the time. Picking up verse uh, 20. When evening... When it was evening, he took his place with the twelve, and while they were eating, he said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me. And they became greatly distressed and began to say to him, one after another, Surely not I. So here they are uh, coming into their nice traditional Passover meal. I don't know if you've ever had a chance to uh, share in what's called the Seder meal. That's uh, to this very day still the meal that is traditionally shared. I heard that at the recent uh, Passover, which was again just at, before our Easter celebration, that because of the shelter in place that many of the Jewish families were sharing their Seder meal, their Passover meal, by way of Zoom. So that's how they could still gather uh, together, even though they couldn't travel and be in each other's houses. Well, Jesus is uh, having that nice Passover meal with his disciples, and you can imagine they're just having some nice dinner conversation, and then Jesus blurts out, one of you will betray me. And sort of like, what? Jesus, what are you talking about? How can that be? There's not possible. No, not me, not me, not me. Well, Jesus explains a little more. He says, he answered, the one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The son of man goes as it is written of him, but woe to that one by whom the son of man is betrayed. It would have been better for him, for that one, not to have been born. Judas, who betrayed him, said, Surely not I, Rabbi. He replied, 
you have said so. One of the ways that the meal would have been happening is that they would have all been uh, seated on the floor. There would have been the kind of unleavened bread, a flat bread. Nowadays, it's known as matzah. The typical way to share the other food that would have been eaten would be to break a piece of that bread and then dip it into the common dish or common bowl to scoop up a bit of that food. And so Jesus says, the one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me, they both had uh, reached with their piece of bread to take a bit of food from the bowl of food at the same time. And that's Jesus' way of indicating who was the one. That is a, a way of eating that expresses such trust, such community, such closeness. And to think that in that representation of a community and family together and friends and loving one another, that in that action meant to show how close you are by dipping food out of even the same dish, that becomes a sign of who would be the one betraying Jesus. And so now Judas himself says, he doesn't say Lord, you notice, he doesn't say Lord, he says, Rabbi, teacher, surely not I. And then Jesus says, Yes. Yes, it is. You know, God knows the human heart. God knows the human way of sin and betrayal. But in spite of that happening, God always intends to save. And no matter what, that is what God is going to do through Jesus. Well, now we turn to what is part of the Passover meal. It was uh, out of a portion of that meal that becomes what we know or call the Lord's Supper, or in this moment, uh, sometimes called the Last Supper. While they were eating, Jesus took a loaf of bread, and after blessing it, he broke it, gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will never drink again, from this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. These words that we hear in this passage and also in Mark, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and also in 1 Corinthians are the words that we now call the words of institution, the beginning of the Lord's Supper, the Last Supper. Jesus took, again, it was traditional part of the meal to take wine, to take bread, and then take wine. And it actually happened more than one time. But in this particular moment, Jesus changes the meaning. And he takes the bread, and he blesses it, he breaks it, and he gives it, says, take, eat, this is my body. Then he takes the cup, and he gives thanks, and he gives it, and he says, this is my blood. Drink of it, all of you. The blessing is um, in the word, in the Greek is eulogio, which is like a good word, a good saying, a blessing, praising God. And then when he gives thanks, where it says about the wine, he gave thanks. The word in the Greek is eucharistio, eucharistio. That word eo, eu. Uh, is representing the word good. And then charistio, eucharistio. Does that sound anything familiar? Like Eucharist? Uh, that's where we get another one of the ways we talk about Holy Communion, the Lord's Supper, Eucharist. Um, we have many ways of talking about 
the special gift that Jesus gives to give us that he is present with us. There's an aspect of this I hadn't thought of until I was reading in the commentary. When you think about it, bread, to get to the bread that we enjoy, if you still enjoy some sort of bread, even if it has to be gluten-free. Uh, but thinking of wheat in particular at the moment, uh, the wheat, it has to be harvested. It has to be cut down. It has to be sorted and shifted and shaken and separated. And then that wheat grain is to be ground up till it's small and then mixed and kneaded and then put into fire. I had never really thought about that, what the wheat grain goes through to become bread for us, a gift that gives us life and nourishment and enjoyment, and yet goes through so much. Jesus gives his own body to be broken, transformed, to become life for us. And the same thing with the grape for wine. It, it grows and freely and enjoying it, the sunshine and the rain. But then there comes a time when it's harvested and it's again cut off. Uh, it can no longer grow. It will no longer grow and change and live. And then it is put in, especially in those days, stomped under people's feet to be turned into wine. So Jesus sheds his own blood which is, again, to give life, to become a source of life. Now, that bread of life and then that wine representing, often in the Bible, joy. So one is a nourishment, an essential we might call, but the other is the representation of joy in life. And Jesus wants to let us have the fullness of life, a nourishing and a strengthening, but also a joy. One of the things that is unique in Matthew's version of telling about what we call the Lord's Supper is he talks about that phrase, for the forgiveness of sin. We have a way of saying the words when we are sharing Holy Communion, and it's actually putting together the words from Mark, Luke, Matthew, and 1 Corinthians. But the part that we always will say, and it comes here from the Gospel of Matthew, is it is for the forgiveness of sins. And that is absolutely, mostly, what we know and understand, the meaning of the gift of Jesus' own body and blood, the bread and the wine, for us in Holy Communion. But I also think more about what a meal represents. And again, there's that sense of community, uh, togetherness bonding, connection, strengthening, food, what it is for. It is for strengthening. The meal is connected with the Passover, that lamb that sheds its blood to save from death. And it is also a celebration of freedom. We are being set free from sin. All of these things, there are so many things. It's also an image of the day that will come when we celebrate this in its perfect way, to know God's love perfectly. There's so many layers, so much that can be reflected on, always, always thinking about the forgiveness that we receive. But I also like to remember about the strengthening, like food strengthens us and wine gladdens. So the strengthening and the joy that we also receive when we are given the body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now the meal takes another turn though. And this is picking up in verse 30. When they had sung the hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus said to them, You will all become deserters because of me this night, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go ahead of you to 
Galilee. Peter said to him, Though all become deserters because of you, I will never desert you. Jesus said to him, Truly I tell you, this very night, before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, Even though I must die with you, I will not deny you. And so said all the disciples. So they, they share uh, part of the traditional part of the Passover meal would also have been sharing hymns or certain psalms, particular psalms. Then after that conclusion, it says they go out to the Mount of Olives. I hope maybe in your Bible and towards the back, there should be a page of a map that would be indicating Jerusalem around the time of Jesus. And if you turn, it's probably one of the very nearly the last maps you would have in your Bible and see if you can find one like that. And so I'll try to show you this one a little bit. Oh, can you see that? Uh, probably not too well. So hopefully you've got one in your own Bible. Well, if you look on this map of Jerusalem in Jesus' time, you'll see there's the area that has the temple, and then there is the area where it might show where Jesus shared in the Last Supper with the disciples. Outside of the city, uh, more to the east, this is the area called Mount of Olives, and that's where Jesus uh, takes the disciples to share in this last moment, just before he, uh, he begins to pray in what we, what we know as Gethsemane. But before that happens, he tells them that they will all be deserters. And naturally, uh, they're shocked again. How could that be? Lord, we would never do so. We would never abandon you. Well, Jesus had spoken in those phrases about the end time and how when the Son of Man would return, that there would be these who would be led astray, who would fall away, that there would be uh, false shepherds and such. And so he recalls that, but he also says, that's even now that kind of scattering, that kind of falling away. It's not only far away, it happens even now. And we know that that's true. We can be weak sometimes, and we don't always hold strong to Jesus or hold strong to our faith. We mean well, we want to, but we don't always live up to that hope and that expectation, even of ourself. Jesus knows what is going to come, and he, he tries to prepare them, but they just can't understand. And so I always do appreciate Peter. He always is one who, who speaks up uh, boldly. He's very confident, and he says, of course not. No, no, I will never. He's like, I will fight for you. Maybe they were expecting a fight. Maybe they thought they would have to stand up and fight. But that wasn't Jesus' intention. Still, he lets them know before the cock crows. Before the cock crows, wherever, whenever that might be, it really could be any time through the night. It doesn't happen to be just the moment of dawn, but even so, there are the time that Peter will deny Jesus, and that we'll hear about that in the chapters yet to come. But even so, Peter believes that he will stay strong. He's like, I will be there even if I must die with you. And the rest of them say the same. Well, they are at the Mount of Olives, and there's a place there called Gethsemane, which was uh, either a garden or a place, especially where there were olive trees and where there was very likely a place to press the olives, to make olive oil. So it would have been towards the lower slope of the Mount of Olives. There were some very old olive trees that I've known people who have been able to go to Jerusalem, to the Holy Land, and have been to the place and have seen some very, very ancient olive trees. I don't want to burst anyone's bubble, but apparently, those are not the same olive trees. 
even though they are very, very old. And we know that because when the Romans came to take on Jerusalem in 70, in the year 70 AD, they took olive trees from that very same place and they chopped them down to turn into firewood to cook their food while they were laying siege. They took some of the trees and turned them into the siege engines uh, to be able to again uh, conquer Jerusalem. And so none of the very same olive trees from that time uh, do exist. But it is still the place and there are some very, very old olive trees there. Well, Jesus takes them now to the Garden of Gethsemane. And they are going to take some time where he needs to pray. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. He took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be grieved and agitated. Then he said to them, I am deeply grieved, even to death. Remain here and stay awake with me. Jesus is facing the most difficult moment of his entire ministry, of his entire life. And he does feel it. He is fully God, but he is fully human. And what human being wants to face death? Even though it may be going into willingly, it is not entered with a sense of desire or hope by any means. And so he asks the disciples to wait with him. Kind of like he talked about being on the watch, waiting for the bridegroom. He invites them to be kind of like those bridesmaids in the story he told about the 10 bridesmaids. But he is himself full of anguish. Again, the reminder of the full humanity of Jesus and how Jesus understands us. He understands our, our own grief, our own trial. The part of this that reminds us that Jesus is human like us and he can understand how we feel. Well, Jesus goes to pray and he steps aside, but he asks the others to wait, to stay awake for him. Jesus continues, and going a little farther, he threw himself on the ground and prayed, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass for me, yet not what I want, but what you want. And Jesus spoke of God as father often throughout his ministry. He taught us in the Lord's Prayer to pray, Our Father, and he also would speak of God as your Father, meaning yours and mine. Here he prays in a very, very personal level. He says, My Father. The word is an Aramaic word, which is Abba. Again, that is a more familiar, close, caring way. It's like, instead of the more formal father, but more like dad, papa, daddy. And it is in that way he, he turns to God, my father. And he again expresses that deep personal yearning that this would not have to be the path forward for salvation. But he also includes that phrase, yet not what I want, but what you want. I find for myself this is a helpful prayer because to me it says we can express the honest yearnings, hopes, concerns to God and be truthful and honest but also 
to remember that we can also hopefully conclude those kinds of honest sharing to God with that same wording, not my will, but your will. Well, Jesus uh, turns back and he says, then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, so could you not stay awake with me one hour? Just like the story he told about the bridesmaids who all fell asleep waiting for the bridegroom to return. His own close disciples couldn't even keep their eyes open. So he says again, verse 40, 41, Stay awake and pray that you may not come into the time of trial. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Just as I find a certain comfort in Jesus' own humanity being expressed in this moment, I find some comfort in an odd way of the disciples' very humanity, their inability to keep their eyes open. We want so much to be there to serve Jesus, but we all mess up sometimes. And the disciples did too. Picking up verse 42, and again, he went away for the second time and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. Again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, are you still sleeping and taking your rest? See, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Jesus knows. He knows this is the moment. This is the time. But he does not hide. He does not run away. He gathers the disciples to be ready to face what is coming next. That sense of Jesus connecting to us, that humanity of Jesus, is what makes him our savior in the fullest sense. In the book of Hebrews, it speaks of that too, in chapter two, in verse 14 through 18. And I think it gives a good perspective on what is happening and what has just happened here. This is uh, Hebrews, book of Hebrews, chapter 2, verse 14 through 18. Since therefore the children share flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared the same things, so that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by the fear of death. For it is clear that he did not come to help angels, but the descendants of Abraham. Therefore he had to become like his brothers and sisters in every respect, so that he might be merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make a sacrifice atonement for the sins of the people because he himself was tested by what he suffered, he is able to help those who are being tested. Jesus knows, he understands the trials, the challenge, the anguish that we might face. And in that he is merciful and he chooses to take on our sins and in turn give us new life and forgiveness. We pray in our Lord's Prayer, Our Father, 
who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Hope you have a blessed week. Mm -hmm.